Hello, everybody. Welcome to this particular session. This is uh, the RSS History Sessions AGM, followed by a presentation from Bob Worcester on his history of um, market research. One of the processes or protocols in the RSS is that we hold a general meeting before an open meeting like this. I just wanted to say a few words about the election of officers. Um, uh, we, uh, we had one vacancy on the committee um, and we put out a, 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 a flyer seeking applicants. We got a, a very rich field of applicants, which made choice very, very difficult. Um, but in the end, we are proposing that, that that one position, full membership, should be filled by Paul Smith, who's um, a professor at Southampton University. Um, but the, there were two other uh, applicants who we were very keen to bring into the uh, into the section. Um, someone called uh, Chaitra Nagaraja, who's a, an academic in the US, and Altia Lorenzo Arribas, another academic up in Scotland. And both of those ladies have agreed to be co-opted onto the committee. So the proposal today is that all the existing committee members wish to stay in post, that we um, take Paul Smith on in a full membership capacity and that Chatra and Altia will join us on um, a co-opted basis, along with an existing co-opted member, Mark Casson from Reading University. So uh, it's a very quick canter over the ground. I didn't want to uh, hold up the presentation. Uh, unless anybody has any any objections or um, and just put it to you, can I can this be carried non cam non com? Any any voices? No, good. Well, I think that that if you like concludes the um, the uh, formal part of this particular process. Um, do you want to say a few words, John, by way of introduction of our speaker uh, coming up in a few moments? Okay. Is, it, uh, is this the proper introduction or is this the introduction to the introduction? Well, it, it, I'm just looking to see whether we've got um, the, the mechanics here. People should be aware that Bob himself has recently had um, uh, some voice problems. And so rather than speaking himself for an hour, he has recorded a session, which is his, his, his this presentation he would have given. So we'll be getting a recording of that uh, very shortly. But then Bob himself will be available for Q&A at the end of that particular uh, presentation. So that was, that was the preliminary that I was alluding to, to John. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just give a short introduction to who Bob is. Uh, somehow it's very appropriate to having Bob on a small screen because for me, he's the most televised statistician of his age because he was forever on TV talking about elections and such like. So somehow the small screen seems to be his natural uh, environment so you'll realize immediately that bob's an american he's an american who spent most of his life he's an american who spent most of his life in britain he came to britain in 1969 uh, when he founded a company called Murray market and opinion research international and for decades, I think he was the leading practitioner in the field, which not many people from Kansas City are knighted. He was knighted in 2005, so he's Sir Robert Worcester. Uh, he's a very, he's, as I say, he's, he's been the top of his game for an awful long time, and uh, we're very pleased to have him. I don't know if that connects to anything in the ether. Did anybody hear me? Yes, 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 I heard you. Good, thank you. Me too, John. Oh, um, uh, I, I opted for the short version of the intro, Bob, 
rather than for the long term. Bob's, Bob's been a great contributor to all aspects of British public life, education and culture and so on. And he's, he's a great addition to the country. Do you want to take it, Bob? Can I have that in writing? Yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, John. Are you a member of the Statistical Dining uh, Diners Club? No, 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 I'm too humble for that. Oh, well. Uh, you can come as my guest. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I was very surprised to be invited to be. Of course, the average age is about 85. So, Lou, have we got the um, Bob's, Bob's presentation package? Yes, if um, Sir Robert kindly go share his screen. Well, um, we'll have the presentation now. Yeah. Public opinion research is to me a way of life. It gives them curious, intelligent, interested view of society, which is almost unique. It provides a means by which alert, but not indolent, young people might taste of a broad variety of experiences without being coming too attached to any one stream, and therefore limit their opportunity to move upward in the trade, if they wish, or outward into a wide variety of occupations and callings. To me, public opinion is fascinating, kaleidoscopic in its variety, its breadth, and its opportunity. The secret to the success of our industry is to be in the business of measuring people's views systematically and objectively, and advising clients, in my case, mainly governments and not-for-profit organizations, NGOs, who wish to know what people do, what they know or think they know, and their views, people being people, these change from time to time. So what is this mercurial thing called public opinion? Is it vox populi, vox di? To address another key question, public opinion friend or foe, I should begin by defining what it is that we mean by the concept of public opinion. I've defined it very simply as public opinion, the collective view of a defined population. Two decades ago, at a meeting of the World Association for Public Opinion Research called WAPOR, I added my definition to those who had thought about what it is that we do in attempting to measure public opinion. My definition was and is public opinion is the collective view of a representative sample of a defined population. One scholar, who in my view is one of the deepest thinkers about this topic, Slavko Splashel at the University of Ljubljana. In his introduction to his edited work, Public Opinion and Democracy in 2001, wrote as the Latin saying goes, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is supposed to be equal to the voice of God. Yet public opinion is also believed to be like an ignorant, vulgar person who reproves everyone and talks most about what he understands least, as Hegel quoted Italian Renaissance poet, Ladek Ficcio, if that's the way you pronounce it, Aristo. Another split shell. For over a century and a half, controversies on the nature and functions of public opinion have centered on the problem of the tyranny of the majority, lack of competency in citizens, parliamentary representation, manipulation of the masses by persuasive communication and propaganda and many others. Without any doubt, the controversies go on today as they have for centuries. Think back to the Falklands. The Prime Minister expressed 100% support for Vox Populi 
were the people of the Falklands in his response to the Argentinian, sorry, in her response to the restoration of Las Malvinas to Argentina. There are daily demands for a referendum on Europe here in Great Britain, and it continues. The British civil service is adopted for the most part, although some departments are giving rather more lip service than dedication to evidence-based policymaking. Even confusing survey evidence with consultations, referendums, and plebiscites. I'll come to those later. What is public opinion? Although the term public opinion as such was not used until the 18th century, phenomena that closely resembles public opinion seem to have occurred in many historical epochs. References to popular attitudes can be found in the history of Babylon and Assyria. Stories abound of the caliph disguising himself to go out and mingle with the people to see what they were saying about his governance. And in classical Greece, it was observed by many that everything depended on the people and the people were dependent on the word. Cicero observed and took account of and manipulated public opinion in the late Roman Republic. Plato had a view, opinion is more obscure than knowledge, but clearer than ignorance. The Italian political philosopher Niccolio Machiavelli wrote that princes should not ignore public opinion, popular opinion, he called it, particularly in regard to such matters as the distribution of offices. He would likely have employed, <clears throat> excuse me, pollsters to determine the public will for his prince, for he warns his prince that in order to rule, he must know the nature of his subjects thoroughly. What Rousseau said in the mid 18th century is resonance today when considering the role of public opinion in a democratic society. I quote Rousseau, we have seen that the legislature belongs and can only belong to the people. The initiative for issuing laws, however, comes from the prince. To discharge this office, he needs a good strategic point, a vantage point, from which to survey the climate of opinion, a matter in which the great legislator is secretly concerned. The prince must decide which convictions of the people are active enough to support legislation. Law may be based only on prior agreement on the sense of community which constitutes the actual foundation of the state. Just as an architect before erecting a great edifice observes and sounds out the ground to see if it can support the weight, the wise legislator does not begin by drawing up laws by which are good in themselves but first investigates whether the people for whom they are intended is capable of, bear, of bearing them. David Hume said in 1741 that all governments rest on public opinion. Aristotle stated centuries earlier that he who loses the support of the people is a king no longer. Much more recently, Abraham Lincoln said that public opinion is everything and went on to avow that he saw his role as the elected leader of the United States as finding out what his electorate wanted and within reason giving it to them. He went out to visit, he tells us, with his countrymen on horseback to take what he called his public opinion baths. The first book devoted wholly to the subject of public opinion was written in Britain in 1828, four years before the Reform Act by William McKinnon. His requisites for having meaningful public opinion were three, wealth sufficiently diffused to bring on a sizable middle class, communications so that information could be effectively dispersed and moral principle. 
so that neither despotism nor dictatorship could overrule the will of the people. He attributes these tests to explain the rise of the power of public opinion in the developed countries of the day, Britain, France, Germany, America. And he rejected any sense of the existence of public opinion in the countries where his three requisites were absent, giving Turkey as his prime example at the time, saying that a constitutional government established tomorrow in Turkey might not last six months as the requis requisites for public opinion not being in Turkey in existence at that time. Tocqueville, of course, wrote about it in Democracy in America during 1835 to 40, as did Bryce much earlier, extensively in the American Commonwealth in 1888, describing public opinion as the ultimate force in government, the real source of the president's power, its influence on the Supreme Federal Court, and on the interpretation of the Constitution and much else. Walter Lippmann, <clears throat> the American, in his classic public opinion book, was not published until 1922. Lippmann pointed out that the analyst of public opinion must begin by recognizing the triangular relationship between the scene of the action, the human picture of that scene, and the human response to that picture working itself out on the scene of the action. He used the simile of pictures inside the heads of human beings, the pictures of themselves, of others, of their needs, purposes, and relationships, which he said are their public opinions. Those pictures which are acted upon by groups of people or by individuals acting in the name of groups are public opinion with capital letters. He considered first the chief factors which limit the public's access to the facts, which he describes as artificial censorships. The limitations of social contract, comparability, a meager time available in each day for paying attention to public affairs, the difficulty of making a small vocabulary express a complicated world, and finally, the fear of facing those facts which would seem to threaten the established routine of men's lives. One important point that Lippmann made is that inevitably our opinions cover a bigger space, a longer reach of time, a greater number of things than we can directly observe. They have therefore to be pierced together out of what others have reported and what we can imagine. Or to draw an important distinction. We don't measure truth, we measure perceptions. That's what pollsters do, measure truth. No, measure perceptions, yes. But the reality of the world of public policy, as well as the media and industry, is that it is perception, not fact, that determines public opinion. As the first century slave philosopher Epictetus stated, perceptions are truth because people believe them. Lippmann observed, as have others since the perplexing fact, true today as nearly a hundred years ago, that the existence of a force called public opinion is in the main taken for granted. His plea was that it should not be and there is an alternative to government by patronage and pork, amalgamating and stabilizing thousands of special opinions, local discontents, private ambitions, besides government by terrier, terror, terror, and obedience. And that is government based on such a highly developed system of information, analysis, and self-consciousness that, quote, the knowledge of national circumstances and reasons of state is evident to all men. Lippmann's conclusion was this. There is no prospect, 1922, at any time which we can conceive 
that the whole invisible environment will be so clear to all men that they will spontaneously arrive at sound public opinions of the whole business of government. And even if there were a prospect, it's extremely doubtful whether many of us would wish to be bothered or would take the time to form an opinion on any and every form of social action which affects us. The only prospect which is not visionary is that each of us has his own sphere and will act more and more on a realistic picture of the invisible world and that we shall develop more and more men who are ex expert in women in keeping these pictures realistic. Outside the rather narrow range of our own possible attention, social control depends upon devising standards of living and methods of audit by which the acts of public officials and industrial directors are measured. We cannot accept ourselves, inspire or guide all these acts as the mystical Democrats always imagine but we can steadily increase our real control over these acts by insisting that all of them shall be plainly recorded and their results objectively measured. I should say perhaps that we can progressively hope to insist for the working out of such standards and of such audits has only begun. Remember that was nearly a hundred years ago. Why, after all this time and so much empirical proof of reliability of the findings of public opinion polls still regarded with such skepticism? Why then in 1922, the public opinion polling as we know it today was still some 20 years from invention, did let them see that auditing procedures it represented is it still so far from being accepted by the policymakers and industrial leaders 90 years on? Lippmann, wise man that he was, had even then the answer, or at least partly so. Bureaus of government research, industrial audits, budgeting, and the like are the ugly ducklings of reform. They reverse the process by which interesting public opinions are built up. Instead of presenting a casual fact, a large screen of stereotypes and dramatic identification, they break down the drama, break through the stereotypes, and offer men and women a picture of facts, which is unfamiliar to them and to them impersonal. When this is not most painful, it is dull. And those to whom it is painful, the trading politician and the partisan, who has much to conceal, often exploits the dullness that the public feels in order to remove the pain that they feel. The statesman, the corporate executive, the party leader, the head of a voluntary organization, found that they need assistance in so-called in the expert, the scientist, the chemist, the physicist, the geologist, Although they called in experts, Lippmann observed, they were slow to call in the social science. He went on at length both to demonstrate the need for the outside, independent, well-funded expert social science and suggested ways in which it might come about, saying, if the analysis of public opinion of the democratic theories in relation to the modern environment is sound in principle, then I do not see how one can escape the conclusion that such intelligence work is the clue to betterment. The number of social phenomena, which are now recorded as small, the instruments of analysis are very crude, the concepts often vague and uncriticized, but enough, he believed, had been done to demonstrate that unseen environments can be reported effectively they can be reported to divergent groups of people in a way which is neutral to their prejudice and capable of overcoming their subjectivism. But nearly a hundred years on, we can still see the hesitance of politicians and see efforts to fund, to encourage, utilize, employ, objective, systematic, interpreted, independent research tools. 
that in the intervening years have become almost, almost instantaneous, and statistically sound and free of bias. We still need to know more, much more, about how politicians and civil servants take account of public opinion, both in day-to-day -day functioning and in policy making. This was pointed out by Eden Katz in 1995. So let me ask, what is it about policymakers that the, engenders the fear of the findings of survey research? As I tell the story, some pick at it as a bird picks it, it crumbles on a table, seeking the bit that supports their own prejudice so they can hold it up to the assembly, quote it to the media, build it into their speeches to proclaim, my idea is sound and has the support of public opinion on its side. One esteemed chancellor some years ago told me there are many parallels here with their use of scientific data as well as the statistical findings of survey research. If it inconveniently does not support the politician's case, some will admit a surrogate, as did Tony Benn, the late Tony Benn, in his argument to the House of Commons against Britain's participation in the Falklands War, brandishing a handful of letters that supported him. And those who did would, of course, be those who wrote a self-selecting sample. He have found public opinion is swinging massively against the war. The following day, The Economist published our poll, which showed that 83% of the British people were in favor of sending the task force to regain control over the Falklands. Hearing wrote in 1965, like fog or smoke, public opinion is obvious in its larger manifestations but is intangible at closer view. Quoting Bryce way back in 1893, as describing it as impalpable as the wind. He views it as the breath of life in the politics of democracy. Very poetic. His view was that public opinion has vital importance as a symbol, than for no value other than directing human affairs through the consensus that emerges from discussion and persuasion. The validity of government by public opinion, he argues, lies in the kind of social entity it helps to establish and the attitude of mind that it encourages. Others still today dismiss the force of public opinion as mercurial or irrelevant or both. <clears throat> Former British Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd wrote to me some years ago to say, I believe that if we followed the polls, we would have been in and out of the community services several times in the last 20 years on matters of principle, like the monarchy and membership of the European community, the job of any politician is to persuade, not automatically to follow. If he fails to persuade, he loses his objective and fail in his profession. Douglas Hurd wrote to me in 1993. I'm fairly on record in agreement with the principle enunciated in Douglas Hurd's letter and endorsed the idea that the job of the politician is to lead, not follow public opinion. This is the, that is, is the job of managers to manage, not necessarily to endorse the results of either customer or staff and staff attitudes surveys. I tend to say to Douglas Hearn and to Tony Benn and the like, uh, I am also personally opposed to referendums on any matter other than ones of constitutionality. It seems to me that having existed for over 800 years with some sort of a representative form of government, like a Magna Carta, only you are planning to take away citizens' rights, such as when giving sovereignty over the EEC as was, or devolution to Scotland and Wales, or replacing the pound sterling with a common currency. But unlike, unlike Douglas Hurd, I believe that a referendum is justified. I have to say though, when former government cabinet minister Eric Pickles canceled my firm's contract to carry out place surveys, 
for the nation's local governments, which opted into the umbrella contract that we had, properly worn, won in a competitive tender at a flat entry cost for them of 3,700 pounds. I was horrified when he told protesting local government ministers object, objecting to his cancellation and officials still wanted to know what their constituents thought. He said they should have a referendum, which would cost 100,000 pounds. So now those so-called consultations are the thing catches catch can events, which too often are captured by the pressure groups, have divisive turnouts, and are in some cases a fix and in others completely ignored and in any case, much more expensive than proper than properly executed opinion posed by reputable firms. Having said that, I feel that too many politicians and for that matter, managers drift too far away from those that they lead, either through ignorance, difficult in this day of instant poll, that Mrs. Thatcher managed it, hubris, her aide, Sir Bernard Ingham, once told me that the boss had dis dismissed one of my poll's results out of hand, saying I'd only ask a thousand people and she had 13 million behind her. Or indeed indifference, when she'd studied science and should have had some knowledge of stats. Still others feel that polls are becoming too powerful. According to a speech by the former Labor Deputy Leader Roy Hattersley, the opinion poll is, quote, a major disincentive to ideological politics. He stated that he neither wished to prohibit polls in any way, limit their use, but merely observed that the polls' existences and increasing sophistication makes politicians believe they can choose between principle and popularity. Politicians always thought they knew what the people wanted. I have a number of examples of that. Now, in the newspaper, however, tell them, tell them with apparent certainty, they can even identify the needs and demands of target voters. The newspapers, though, reinforce the popular prejudices. There's never been a time in our history when it was more difficult for a politician to say, I will lead rather than follow. He goes on or she goes on to say, if the Liberal Party of 1885 had employed Maury, Gladstone would have faced a real test of courage and conscience. In his review of Explaining Labor's Landslide slide, a book that Roger Mortimer and I wrote uh, after the uh, Tony Blair Labor landslide in 1999. Hattersley was still at it, describing our assertion that polls do not advocate any particular policy, subject, or topic as at best naive, arguing that polls advocate doing what is popular rather than what is right. And doing so, he demonstrates that despite years of effort, he still does not consider polls the neutral measuring instrument that they are in fact when responsibly carried out, or at least should be. Or Prime Minister Callahan, on the same evening I'd spent an hour at number 10 with him, poring over polling data, reams of statistical tables, and having a spirited discussion of their meaning along with his political advisor, Tom, now Lord McNally, being interviewed live at eight o'clock that evening on World in Action. And he was challenged to react to the previous day's Maury poll in the papers, which showed Labour with just a 2% lead. Asking about the, asked about the findings, the prime minister replied, oh, I look at them out of interest, but I don't pay a lot of attention to opinion polls. Later in the interview, however, when questions about the question about the problem of separatism in Scotland replied with a wave of his hand, oh, everybody knows that only 20% of Scots are in favor of separatism. Oh, 
I don't know about that, Mr. Callahan. How do we find out what people are thinking in a way we can regard as reliable? Of themselves, properly conducted public opinion polls are both systematic and objective. It is when they get into the hands of some politicians and their spend doctors, biased journalists and pundits, who wish to use polls to prove a point or use them for their own ends without scruple. Then they become a threat to democracy. In the hands of a modern day Machiavelli, they are indeed a threat to democracy, especially where there are politicians in positions of power who without scruples in the belief that, that the sun at the end justifies the mean and without constitutional safeguards to protect minority rights. If politicians had employed polls as informative conduits, supplementing the cab driver and station manager of old, perhaps the Liberal Party of Gladstone would not have been passed into history and powerlessness. Perhaps the Labor Party under Foote, Kinnock, and Hattersley wouldn't have spent nearly two decades in the wilderness, clearly ideologically, rather than the representative of the electorate. Perhaps the Conservative Party of Margaret Thatcher and John Major wouldn't have limped through more recent, in year, more recent years than by 1997 faced the Blair landslide that was to come. As did Harold Wilson, Tony Blair won three elections, a landslide, a second landslide, and a landslip, which I defined as a small landslide. He understood how to manipulate public opinion he and indeed some of his advisors were masters of it. The late great student of public opinion, Daniel Yankelovich, worried that polls have grown into ever more misleading. Far from giving leaders insight into the real concerns of the public, they often add to the disconnect that separates the leadership class in the United States from the mainstream of the citizenry. We all must join in that concern. To some degree, I share Yankelovich's worry about superficial polls, the cheap and cheerful polls, polls done by advocacy to group, by pollsters without concern for loaded questions, either through greed or fear, journalists who pick out the findings and trumpet the headline that supports their paper's party line, rather than reporting the findings which truly represent public opinion. So politicians should worry about what the public thinks. After all, Burke in his way, not to mention Margaret Thatcher in hers, and Gordon Brown in his, found out what it means to lose public confidence. But why should senior civil servants and central government and senior local government officials worry much about what the public thinks? The answer is, in my experience, too many don't. Although over these past several decades, this has changed, changed radically, especially in local authorities. My first client in a local authority was in 1979. In the next steps agencies, which no longer exist, of many quangers and even of royal commissions do now look 10 to look for properly conducted opinion polls in this country. And in America especially, pollsters themselves should consider their responsibilities not only to their clients, the media and policymakers, but as well to the wider public and to the future of democracy itself. In companies, in NGOs, in trade unions, in all walks of life, survey research can and should, in my view, be used to inform those in positions of power over others. The lives of their opinions, their attitudes, their values, in order for them to make judgments informed by these views rather than determined by them, and thereby make better decisions in the exercise of their power. The question I address regularly is public opinion, friend or foe. I argue that public opinion is real. It is important. It is often, but in these days, rarely wrong. Just too often, mis often misused, certainly 
often manipulated and much understood. I hope that by the end of this lecture, you will go away with a better understanding of the uses and abuses of opinion polls and will regard them in a useful if somewhat dangerous in the wrong hands, aid to better understanding what people are thinking, their worries, fears, hopes, and aspirations. Certainly, I would hope that you would discount both sides of the pure all debate I heard once on the BBC's World of One. One of our best news programs, presented by one of the best of our news journalists. He made reference to a recent political poll showing the support for the Conservative Party at 32%, demeaning it by saying that it was only one poll. What I'm sure he knew very well for the fourth quarter at that time, in 96 different polls, that the Tory party had been found to be reputable, found by reputable polling organizations to between 30 and 34 percent in their voting intention with the average 31.9 interviewing over 150,000 people the current then tory party chairman responded by saying the polls go up and down in fact they hadn't tories were struck stuck on around 32 percent for over six months why should a respected political journalist be dismissing and worse yet that let a party chairman, any party's chairman, off the hook like this. Often I'm asked, how do you conduct your polls? The key concept of survey research is the one person, one vote model of defined populations. The normal universe from which a representative sample is drawn is the nation state. We read of most survey research as representative of the British adults or American or Korean or any place else and take this for granted unless told differently. Generally speaking, opinion poses that have classically been defined and used in political discourse as national legislatures, national media, and national debate at both the elite and public levels, which have been derived from surveys of representative samples of adults within one country. If poll findings are derived from anything else, one would expect the sample from which they are drawn to be clearly defined, as in the study carried out for the British Council, among a sample of, quote, successor generations, young people in 13 countries. These people were defined as between 24 and 35, well-educated, and either studying for postgraduate qualification or employed. Very precise. In market research often and in public opinion polling occasionally, a much narrower defined population is the likely universe, in quotes. Thus workers in a family of interest to the factory manager and the trade unions and civic leaders in the plant community, residents of local community of interest to civic leaders. Again, politicians, the local media, pressure groups, industrialists thinking of citing a plant there students at the University of Interest to the Government students at LSE when I advised them when they conducted an opinion poll in advance of a mock American presidential election and had more, part, more students taking part in the poll than took part in the mock election, which asked I was no more, more representative. Certain new voters of great interest to me at the last British general election in determining who I thought was going to win by how much of greater interest to the Times, and therefore of greater interest to the broadcast media who diffused the findings, and therefore the political actors who hold on office or prospect thereof was promised or threatened, and therefore to the public, full circle, or young people, or the elderly, or women, or captains of industry or institutional investors, or editors, or parliamentarians, or any slice of society that can be defined with precision and replicability. My question posed friend or foe then begs two questions. Can public opinion be measured? Can public opinion metrics be trusted? First, you have to understand what you're measuring. In my view, there are five things that can be measured by survey research. They're people's behavior, 
their knowledge, their opinions, their attitudes, and their values. The first two are easy to define and understand. Behavior is what people do. Knowledge is what they know, or at least think they know. The other three are certainly more difficult to define and even understand, and certainly much less commonly agreed. I finally settled on a collective view in my definition of public opinion to incorporate three levels of thought that I perceive that we're trying to measure. Opinions, attitudes, and values. I've defined these terms rather than too, rather too poetically, I fear, for scholarly, scholarly adoption. Opinions, the ripples on the surface of public consciousness, shallow and easily changed. Attitudes, the currents below the surface, deeper and stronger. And then the deep tides of public mood, slow to change but powerful. In only 13 words, I've tried to sum up what the Oxford English Dictionary takes 3,867 words to define as opinions. Much of their extensive examination of the nuances of opinion are aimed off our interests, e.g. from 1538, Starkey in England, said in their years, no difference between vice and virtue, but strong opinion. But then again, the principal themes do, however, strike a note. What one thinks or how one thinks about something. Judgment, resting on grounds of something is probable or seeming to be one's own mind to be true, though not established or certain. Now that's distinguished from knowledge, conviction, or certainty. But sometimes, much the same as belief. We were also informed in 1644 by Milton in his Aerogagitica opinion in good men is but knowledge in the making. And in 1794 by Norris in Ideal World, what we call opinion, which is an imperfect assent or judgment Another definition qualified by common, general, public, vulgar, etc. Such judgment or belief on the part of a number or the majority of persons. What is generally thought about something. Also in attributive phases, phrases, as public opinion investigation poll. Polling survey, see opinion poll survey. Here in the words of Thomas Jefferson, you find the recognition of the power of public opinion. According to an 1891 Jefferson in Tucker Life book, the mighty wave of public opinion which has rolled over our republic. This position was supported by Gould and Kolb in 64 in the Dictionary of Social Science. Opinion polls provide a wealth of other detail that tends to be largely ignored. It shouldn't be just a horse race. Measurement of the voting behavior of subgroups, the impact of particular issues, events, personalities, looking at the attitudes of men and women, looking at age, looking at uh, social class, looking at uh, the area of the country, how well informed the voters are. All these can be and are regularly measured in public opinion polls. Furthermore, such information is enlightening, even with a far less standard of accuracy than is preferable for national election pre prediction. And again, quotes on prediction. Analyses can be made of demographic, geographic, attitudinal, or even value-based differences. Statistical techniques include factor and cluster analysis, correspondence analysis, perceptual mapping, and many others that you would expect. Such techniques are also used widely by academic analysts of electoral behavior, some of whom both commission their own polls and make use, others that make use of the public polls. Between elections, regular polls of public opinion are conducted on numerous subjects, both political 
in London, but in the U.S. in particular at the time, this time, these are closely watched by politicians for their relevance to future elections like a month away and sometimes guide their behavior. During the impeachment of the President Bill Clinton, the president used his continued high ratings in the polls as a lever to discourage his opponents from voting to unseat him, unseat him, a vote that the polls suggested would be unpopular and therefore electorally damaging to him. So, in conclusion, the principal focus of the World Association for Public Opinion Research is the study of international comparative studies in public opinion or promulgating standards in the conduct of public opinion research. Wayport's website has some useful documents which can be easily downloaded, including two key ones, a guide to opinion polls. You can pick that up on Google. Go for Wayport. There it is. It's right now celebrating its 76th anniversary down in Spain. It welcomes new members generally, and especially in the annual conference in Spain this week. And that's two on the Wayport website. Finally, to return to my two questions, does and can. Does public opinion exist? Yes, if by that it is meant a force distilled from the media and from the so-called chattering classes, recognized and debated by those who write and comment about public policy, which in turn affects the thinking and actions of political actors and can be measured with objectivity systematically and is replicable within statistical limitations. To avow that something exists can make it so if policymakers believe it does. And we're back then to where we start with bulimic titus. If actions are taken to the belief that a view is held, then it doesn't really matter if it's some sort of truth or merely perception. In this sense, it does exist. The question remains, can public opinion be measured? By my definition, it can, where the ability is there to define the universe with reasonable precision Model the uniform universe to be sampled accurately. Draw a representative sample. Reach the people in the sample with sufficient success to be able to elicit their views. Return them to the researcher. Code the answers and aggregate them with accuracy. Report the collective responses with objectivity. There is now in Britain, and has been since the founding of Gallup in 1938, throughout Europe in the Amazons, perhaps other than in Amazonia and most of Asia. Some world poll, poll should not be trusted because there will still be no representative sampling frame by which a sample can be drawn will accurately with known statistical reliability to be projectable to a known population. Rural areas in China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, much of Africa are still largely untapped by public opinion polling and survey research representative of total adult population. Most research in these countries is of elites, middle classes, the chattering classes, who in their way do represent public opinion in their countries in terms of the power they have to influence events. World opinion on a global scale still lacks rigor, still has little consensus of validity, and will inevitably suffer from an extended debate over the applicability of the concept of one person, one vote, accepted universally when reporting the results of national polls. Further and conclusively, in a true world survey, which ignores the nation state as attempted on one person, one vote, then the views of a Chinese respondent will be counted or the weight hundreds of that of British respondent or Americans. It will be a long time before world opinion will be accepted as valid in this context, if ever. In the meantime, we aggregate national polls. And if we weight the results by population, we find that China, India, Brazil, and Indonesia swamp everyone else. We find an average that, while it's statistically pure, is nonsense in every other way. To conclude, I'm convinced that as a tree falling in the forest makes a noise, 
whether anybody's there to hear it or not. So public opinion exists, perhaps unheard until someone listens. Message to the government, parliament, business, bankers, scientists. Are you listening? Is it Vox Populi, Vox Di? And those people should not be listened to who keep saying the voice of the people is the voice of God, since the riotous of the crowd is always very close to madness. Over to you to decide. So thank you very much for such an enlightening presentation. Uh, for those of you that have um, questions, this is how um, the Q&A session will be run. So if you have any questions, and if you can please list them in the chat rather than raising your hand. And uh, I will read them out. So uh, Sir Robert Worcester could um, you know, answer them accordingly. Since we have a question already, I will start with the one that's already in the chat. Uh, and the question is, is the idea of public opinion meaningful in countries which are deeply divided so that no consensus exists? And Milan Joshi cites as an example, for example, during the British campaign or the 2016 US election. Well, yes, because we uh, look at every national survey and deeply look at differentiation of the views of men and women, of people of different age levels, uh, people in uh, a very different part of the country. So we look at demographics and we look at attitudes uh, and uh, uh, do what we can to provide the client or uh, anyone looking at the data to understand the division that's going on and why the people who are divided take the views that they do. Thank you. A, a follow up question on that? Whose question was it? Milan Joshi's. You got a chance. Uh, thanks very much. That was very helpful. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah, I'm waiting. Maybe people are taking their time to type. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm assuming. Can you do it? Yeah. We have another question uh, yeah. from Mike Hughes. Was the margin of difference in the Brexit referendum sufficient for the decision that ensued? <laughs> Very good question. 52-48 or 48-52. And, uh, you know, was it... Uh, what was the what was the verb? Hello. The what question, was? yeah. So the, the, the question is: Was the margin of difference in the Brexit referendum sufficient for the decision that ensued? Well, I wouldn't think so because it's not within statistical limits uh, of the size of the poll. And as I said in my talk. Uh, you really need to have a modicum of understanding of statistical reliability in a sample size of, say, a thousand. That's the usual 
minimum that we have in Great Britain. In some other countries, certainly in the United States, you find presidential uh, contests uh, being measured with samples of 200, 250, 300, and people look at them without having any idea or any understanding that uh, the margins of error, uh, if you call it error, and I, I've always thought that it's not fair to call it error because that's the way it is, uh, and they can be uh, wildly apart, and certainly that doesn't apply to 5842 and 4258, which are well within statistical liability because they're at 50 plus or minus two. Thank you. So uh, I guess that's somewhat related. Um, there's uh, another question that says, how can statisticians and survey research prevent and help fight against misleading representations of self-selecting surveys like voodoo polls. Oh, thank you very much for that. Voodoo polls are the bane of my existence. They go on and on, and it's so difficult to stop them because anybody can take a poll. It's a free country, and uh, actually, in some countries, it's not the case, but certainly in Great Britain, uh, anybody can take a poll of any number that they wish in any way that they have uh, structured it and claim that it's, uh, well, if not near the voice of God, at least uh, uh, sensible. And I don't think they're sensible at all. But I, I fight against it. And I started the, this whole talk by saying uh, uh, effectively, uh, you know, how can we deal with this kind of thing? And it's difficult. I did teach at uh, City University in the Graduate Center of Journalism for about 10 years, oh, 20 years ago. And I still have had the occasional telephone call from somebody who is a journalist and who remembers something about my uh, lecture and asked me, to expand on it or argue the question or whatever. But uh, I try and hammer voodoo polls, what I call voodoo polls. And somebody recently, one of the senior pollsters in the country, I don't remember who it was, uh, made reference to what I call voodoo polls. Uh, but uh, I really work hard on the journalists and before every election, try to uh, get a slot uh, in Parliament, in the Commons, to go in and offer a briefing on the opinion polls in the coming election and how to believe them or not to believe them. Uh, and some of my some of my competition, uh, if you want to call it that, or colleagues uh, in the business, do the same thing. Thank you. That was a question from Anthony Masters. We have another question from David Gordon that asks, do you think that attempted global surveys such as the World Value Survey or Gallup World Poll have any value? Oh, I certainly do. I'm very, very much uh, very enthusiastic about the World Value Survey because it is not uh, pretending to be a world in, in the entire sweep of the of the world uh, but they they have now oh uh, something like 110 countries or 105 countries in the most recent it, they do the world value survey and I used to be the uh, I was one time one year uh, the uh, what did they call us um, anyway responsible for the British poll but we haven't been able to raise funding for Britain to be included this year, whereas they've got about well over 100 countries that are in this year's survey. But the main interest is country by country and how the countries differ in those in the figures they come up with. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other questions? There's nothing coming up at the chat, but you know, I'll give a couple more minutes if people are typing. There's a very long one from David Doe, just appeared. Uh, it says, this possibly relates to the earlier question about voodoo cults. Your title, your talk title mentions the art of asking questions. Yes, indeed. The Tversky and Kahneman and other psychologists often talk of the framing problem. For example, yes. oh, sorry. Uh, for some reason, some people say they will prefer milk, which is 95% fat free, to milk, which is 5% fat even though they're logically the same. Can you say anything about a neutral way of asking questions? Sure, there are lots of neutral ways to ask questions and it's very important that anyone doing proper opinion polls takes a, a good bit of time in developing their questions. There are many uh, things in the system. I, I edited a book uh, oof, now 40 years ago called the Consumer Market Research Handbook, which has an extremely good chapter in that about question construction and was used for, in fact, I got uh, uh, money back from Harvard who used it, that chapter in their book and split it with the lady that had written that particular chapter. Uh, and the rules, are increasingly and have been for all of my career in great in this country over 50 years uh have have excuse me <coughs> i think you had a warning that i've been having a a croaky time in the last few days uh too too much singing i think uh in three three different choirs including the parliament choir the uh now i've lost my train of thought wait a minute um I can think of so many good examples and testing of questionnaires. It's a it's it's very seldom that you don't test a questionnaire in <clears throat> in a focus group or in the field or both uh, in order to determine that the questions are clear, that they are uh, consistent, they are well developed and understandable, particularly, you can't use big, great big words, uh, great complex words and complex thoughts for that matter. Uh, if you're talking to a cross section of the British people, if we're talking to scientists, uh, I did the first, uh, first survey for the public, uh, for Bob, the late Bob May, and then for David King, and then one of their successors over about nine years or 10 years. And there was a lot of, of printing of that uh, around. And I presented it to the uh, House of Lords Committee, the Science and Technology Committee. Uh, and uh, I uh, asked them more or less at the end of my talk if they wanted a, a, a full deck of all the statistical uh, details and everyone in the meeting of that uh, House of Lords committee said, yes, please. So we had reams of uh, those polls or, or packages of the poll data, probably 60 or 80 of them, I think, uh, we had to bind and, and, and give back to uh, the members and with, of course, the uh, uh, interest that we have in that. And uh, most, I think, important was the questions in that survey that looked at the public profile of scientists on the one hand and engineers on the other. And Alex Brewer, who was the, at the time, uh, uh, he was he was the director or principal or from one of the universities, one of the major universities, and then went to the House of Lords. And uh, Alex was uh, very concerned 
and I think did quite a lot uh, about uh, the view that people had of engineers and they tried extremely hard. I also did a very interesting study among the uh, uh, the people, I started to say students, mostly students, didn't have to be, uh, who were on the Welcome Trust gravy train and they uh, they took part in a major study for uh, them on the degree to which they felt confident that they could uh, cut out of their responsibility as a scientist and make it as plain as they could to uh, teach people generally uh, what they thought about and were thinking about scientists and the role that they play. And that was well published at the time, but that was some years ago. Thank you. There's another question from Paul Smith that says, how have changes in the science of sampling affected opinion polling over the span of the time you describe? <laughs> Very so, good uh, question. Uh, we don't can I, oh, sorry, can no. I finish up the question? Yes, of course. Uh, Certainly, the technology for asking questions like phone and the you know World Wide Web, etc., has changed. But what about sampling itself? Well, uh, there's a catch, catch as catch can sort of a sample, which uh, we don't recognize if we can possibly help it. And there are an awful lot. I say an awful lot. There's a handful of journalists who are very well trained in understanding many and a number of them are scientists uh, studied science at university and uh, i think of peter keller for instance uh, who's a well-known name and uh, he was my client on the sunday times when harold evans the late recently late Air harold evans marvelous marvelous client uh, really very very interested in in doing polls and understanding polls and getting them absolutely right. I'll take a quick uh, anecdote about that. Uh, I was always with him on the Saturday that one of our polls was in the Sunday Times and had the right of editorial control that he gave me in his newspaper. And on one occasion, he, he would go down, take me down to what they call the stone in the days that they actually uh, put a piece of paper over a stone and had all the type on it. And uh, I could see right away that they'd misplaced the two columns in a, in a graphic and they were backwards. And it was right on deadline. And I said, Harry, this has got to be changed. And the managing editor was with us and said, but he's the editor. And Harry Evans said, yeah, but Bob's got editorial control over this. And I felt very well justified uh, at the time that Harry stuck up it for me and that they were an excellent client. Excellent. I'm going to miss him, miss Bob and I too. Bob and I were on the WWF uh, world, Worldwide well, they call it now worldwide something for nature and uh, used to be the World Wildlife Fund. And Bob and I sat uh, together on every meeting of that of that group of trustees. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Any other? Yes. Another question. Just for <laughs> In a poll where the result is very finely balanced, as Paul Smith, like the EU referendum, we need to have a procedure defined in advance, setting out the conditions under which the result can be treated as valid. Do you have any comment? Sure. Uh, that's, I would expect that every serious newspaper will have the advice of their pollster who 
in all the major polling organizations, not that many of them. Seems like it sometimes, but uh, there's only it's only a handful that you would think would be uh, very professional and uh, the rest are just getting that way or trying hard uh, and good, good on them. But uh, uh, it's very difficult when it's that narrow to prejudge the response. Uh, the example that I used of the a woman in, in uh, Newsweek say, I think it was, yes, uh, that uh, gave them the fact that their fairly small uh, universe, sorry, sample of, of a defined universe uh, was plus or minus 3%, but she said it was as a fact plus or minus 6%. It was just a nonsense. But the best papers won't do what Derek Jameson said on the Daily Express, the one about the 500 blacks, uh, way back. I mean, that was 35 years ago or 40 years ago. And he said uh, that he didn't really care. It made a good story, so it was only costing him 500 pounds. And uh, so he just laughed and laughed me left me out of the out of the argument. Uh, later, he was on BBC Radio 2, and I was asked to go on his show. And the researcher uh, rang the day before, and she was very careful about the questions that I thought, and she thought, and she thought Derek thought uh, that he would ask, and in a taxi on the way up to uh, the express building, uh, I wrote down on a card, knowing knowing him very well, uh, that the first question he should ask me is, why should we pay any attention to you? You're an American. You don't know anything about what, what we are. And uh, of course, I had to come up with an answer to my own question. And then the second one was, uh, uh, or, oh, I don't know. But anyway, it was a... Uh, of all the questions that she was proposing, uh, he liked the, I think three of them that I wrote in the back of that envelope on the way up to the uh, Daily Express building. But perhaps enough anecdotes. Anecdotes are always very interesting. I think, thank you for that. I, I just want to, in, in full interest of disclosure, I made a mistake when I said that question was from um, Paul Smith. No, it was from Peter Smith. Sorry about that. Uh, any other questions? Isn't there one from Mary, Peter, Paul, and Mary? Uh, there's one from <laughs> from Roger. Sorry, uh, no Mary, but Roger. Uh, Roger Harbord. He's asking, has it become more difficult to obtain a representative sample in recent years? I'd be interested in your views on the pros and cons of multi-level regression and post-stratification, and similar methods which use an unrepresentative sample and involve giving different weight to the views of different in, different individuals. Well, we do have we do have weighting, and I think the the reputable pollsters, polling organizations, do a very careful job of weighting to an appropriate uh, given the national survey the uh, annual surveys, is it still annual? I think it is. Uh, they try not to make it annual, but I think they do. And uh, we look at that because that's that's the big, that's the, the, the number one uh, survey. And we weight against the proportions of uh, age and gender and all of that. I did interview, by the way, for uh, uh, one, of, one of the magazines, <clears throat> the Worc the name of Worcester woman of uh, finding uh, the archetypal. And there was a chap who argued that uh, there should be, it wasn't a chap, now I can not think of who, who it was, but it was a very interesting book that uh, they found the, the classic, the classic person 
who they would put during an election in a mine and he or she would be the one person who would make the decision based on the information that they had uh, who should be president of the United States. Uh, it was quite a quite a silly thing to do, but it was in and it was a long time ago, 45 or 50 years ago. Uh, Roger, give me that. Give me a bit more on that one. Roger. Looks like a, he took my he took my hand. Oh, hello. I've tried un unmuting. Oh, point. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, give me a little bit more on about uh, the question. Um, I guess as a bit of background, um, I did briefly 20 years ago have a uh, job as a as a working on the on the telephones actually asking people opinion polls and it seemed to get um, more difficult to I felt even then it was getting more difficult to get a representative sample as uh, not everybody had a, a you know fewer people had a landline so yes. it's difficult sure. to to do that and um, whether or not whether or not we would and as fewer people had this kind of it became more difficult to put people into traditional social class groupings um, but we I was aware we had we were given quotas to try and get so many people from you know this social class and this um etc and by gender and and age yeah um, to, to so uh, the quota yeah so um quota what's your feelings on, on samples those are quota samples rather than probability samples. Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm thinking is it. But the, these some um, I mean, you seem to be taking a somewhat different approach to that of kind of using the Internet to obtain. You know, a more kind of less representative sample to do more extreme weighting, would you well, say? I, yes. Uh, they're very good at YouGov. I was asked to be on the board and said, don't be silly uh, when they first started out. Uh, uh, Stephen Shakespeare, who is the chief executive, uh, invited me to be on their on their board. And I said, oh, don't be silly. You'll be competing with us. And uh, they, they said, oh, no, I mean, you're the big guy. I, we couldn't possibly be. And about two years later, they had just really piled in with uh, the survey and backing of money. In fact, Nadim Zohawi, uh, who's a member of parliament uh, and is trade, I think one of the trade ministers. And uh, he came to me one time and said uh, they would like to buy Mori. And I said, or he would like to buy Mori. And I said, uh, oh, well, I, it's not for sale. Uh, and he said, well, OK, you buy us. <laughs> and that was that was you go. And I said, no, what do I need another polling organization for? And now look at them. They've done really so well. And by and large, they are a very professional bunch of people. Uh, the waiting question is a good one because it seems unfair, but it really gets it right most of the time in a representative sample. On the other hand, what you were doing was getting quota samples. They were telling you how many ABs, how many C1s, how many C2s, and how many DEs against in, in, a, in a constituency, uh, you were probably working, or maybe you were working in the country, I don't know, but uh, sometimes, and, and a lot of the people who were running the telephones Oh, 20 years ago, as you were, uh, were actors and actresses who were who's always were seeking employment when they were uh, not acting or being actresses. And uh, they would be very good because usually their voices were very good. But then there was a very good job for students to do, as you probably meant, uh, knew. Anyway, thanks for the question. Oh, thanks very much. That's a very helpful, informative answer. Good. 
I've done it myself and I've certainly listened to a lot of telephone conversations. Uh, the best one I think I ever listened to was a lady who said, uh, uh, it was it was the run up to the Falklands War and I was listening to her and the, the lady that was on the, that was giving the interview, uh, it was a panel and we were ringing back the next week uh, for her and uh, she answered the phone and she answered it and said a different thing that she'd said the week before. And then uh, my interviewer asked her to say why it had differed. She said, oh, no, I haven't changed my mind. Yeah, why have you changed your mind was the question. Oh, I haven't changed my mind. And my interviewer had the information there from the previous week, and she was instructed to say that uh, uh, last week when we spoke to you, you said thus and so, what's made you change your mind? And her response was, uh, oh, I, I saw this chap on television and uh, he persuaded me uh, to change my mind. And the interviewer said, well, we, when may we ring you back next week? And she said, oh, yes, yes, when, when you ring, I feel like I'm speaking myself to the prime minister. There's Enough anecdotes? <laughs> As I said, great always, yeah, they're always great. Um, but there is one more question at the moment Good. from James Trinder. He's asking that it has been reported that the 2020, 2021 UK census might be the last one. In your opinion, is no longer conducting a nation one census a good idea or not? Well, I certainly don't think so. And no respectable pollster, commercial pollster, or academic pollster uh, would like to see it go because it is the it is the golden uh, the golden chalice from which we're all drinking and uh, we wait the figures and in fact I had a bad uh, a bad time one time years ago uh, and uh, the reason was that we'd done the weighting against or the, the national opinion poll had not been published. It had been done, but it hadn't been published. And so we were working on a year out of date and the balance wasn't right. I can go all night, but I'm not sure you all can. Uh, I don't some know. Of my, if, some if, of my colleagues that are here are giggling. <laughs> are there any other questions? Uh, I would say I don't think you've been told. I'm not sure whether John said so, but I am a member. I'm a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society and proud to be one. Well, you, you were you were telling us a bit more about yourself. Another question from David Doe uh, came up, uh, which says, our modern world big brother seems very good at identifying swinger, swinging voters and methods. Scrupulous swing are sw swinging, swinging voters and yeah, methods. Voters, yes. Scrupulous or otherwise. Oh, that, they they make a huge difference. They they're not they're not much. Um, they do many times change the outcome of a political poll, and it's because uh, we I've been I think I've done seven eight nine elections, the exit poll. And my company's been involved in doing the exit polls. And everybody, I think, I hope all of you would know that the exit polls get it right. I do have a little anecdote on that one. A member of parliament said to me, uh, 
how come you never get it right? And I said, well, actually, the exit poll last week, I think it was, uh, was spot on. And he said, oh, good. And uh, he said, but uh, that's not, that. It, it's about time, he said. And I said, well, we actually got the, the previous uh, poll, exit poll, spot on. And he said, that's when he said, oh, good. And then he changed that changed the subject because uh, the exit polls have been. And the reason that they are is that we're not talking to people who have uh, thought about a week ahead who they were going to vote for and counted that uh, because they were coming out of the po polling booth. And we got nearly everybody in the idea. There's that one quote. Uh, that I had in in the draft of my speech, which uh, we cut, was uh, uh, <clears throat> the fellow that said, uh, "Oh, for me, yes." Um, one of the pundits said that uh, the, on the Blair election, you remember that. That was 179 uh, o overall majority. And he said, uh, ah, it was Cooper. He's now, now in the Lords. He was then in central office. And he was writing in mm, New Statesman, maybe, or more likely Spectator. And he said, uh, that if Bob Worcester keeps forecasting a labor victory, he'll be uh, the, a laughing stock or words to that effect. And uh, he had said that uh, Blair would not uh, have an overall majority, that it would be easily won by the Tories. But then he was working in conservative central office at the time. So you have to aim off uh, for that. But it's, it's a fun business, I have to say. It's definitely full of the anecdotes, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I hope I've been amusing to a few people. Are there any other questions? I guess maybe since it's um, 25 past uh, and you've, you know, you've talked for so long. Uh, Sir Robert, uh, maybe I would like just to wrap up. I don't know if John Aldrich is still in the audience and would like to say a few words. Well, if not, Sir Bob, Sam, Mike Hughes here. Can I just thank you on behalf of both the history section and the society at large for a very stimulating, interesting and enjoyable presentation. I think uh, we, you know, we, you'd have been quite happy to keep going all night if your vocal cords would have uh, sustained. But um, we've um, greatly appreciated it for the benefit of the wider audience. Uh, we are arranging with Sir Bob to get his um, presentation or reduced form of it in, published in significance, so you'll be able to see it there. But on behalf of everyone, uh, Bob, many thanks indeed. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to everybody who came, and particularly those who asked the questions. <laughs>